I face the mountain that I've never faced before. That's why I'm calling on you, Lord. I know it's been a while. Lord, please hear my prayer. I need you like I never have before. Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes a troubled sea Sometimes it takes a desert oh, oh, To get a hold of me But your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Forgive me, Jesus, I thought I could control whatever life would throw my way. But this, I must confess, has brought me to my knees. I need you, and I'm not ashamed to say, Takes a mountain, oh Lord. Sometimes a troubled sea, sometimes it takes a desert to get a hold of me. Yes. But your love is so much stronger. Than whatever troubles me, yeah. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Oh, sometimes it takes a mountain. I know. Sometimes the trouble. a desert oh God to get a hold of me but your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me sometimes it takes a mountain Trust you and believe. Let's sing that this morning. Sometimes it takes a mountain. Oh, sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes it takes a desert. Trust you and believe. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your awesome presence being with us. Thank you for breath to breathe and strength that we can get on our feet and declare, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Amen. Have your seats this morning as we get into the word. Junior Church, you can go at this time. And, and I'm, I'm just, every day I see these children and I'm saying, God, your word says that you're going to pour out your spirit on them. That our sons and daughters have a spiritual heritage that God has stood up for them. And they are going to, we're going to do everything that we can to ensure that they walk in that. Amen? Amen? And so that's part of, the, part of the reason why we are staying back a little bit next week, Sunday. We, we want to pray, God bless our children. God move upon their hearts, move in their lives. We, we want to see them flourish in God. And um, I, I sense, you know, excuse my expressions a little bit, but, but I feel a good vibes that's happening with God in the spirit, you know. I, I sense God is up to something real good. Amen. I, I, I did, and uh, last week, Wednesday, we, we had a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Listen, prayer is, is what you make it. What you put into it, you're going to get out of it. And, and I said to folks, prayer meeting is, time of prayer is my, is my most important time in life. I, I make sure that that is a priority in my life. Because I realize without prayer, there's no power. And without power, there's no effective ministry. It's just activity. If, if, our, if our preparation is not bathing prayer, it's just activity. We are not going to touch nothing. We, we, are, we are warring not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. And listen, this guy has been at this thing for over 2,000 years plus, you know. You understand the enemy that we are up against. Be not ignorant of the enemy's devices. He's, he's, and I'm not trying to, to big him up. But the reality is we, we serve a God that is greater. But if we don't connect with him, he's going to trap us up. Secret, connect with God through prayer. So I want us to come out this week, this, this Wednesday, and, and spend some time and just hear from the word of God and after that, we're going to just get into some time of intercession. Amen? Hallelujah. So turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And uh, welcome this morning. Good to have you. Glad that you took time out to be here in the house of the Lord. I'm speaking about balanced living. Balanced living. And Matthew 7, 1 says... Judge not that you be not judged. It is simple, amen? Judge not that you be not judged. Oftentimes, pertaining to this particular verse of scripture, you would hear people say, only God could judge me. Only God can judge me. And for a number of people, that is, that is some kind of hiding. Hide behind the statement. They've recognized what they would have done is, is, is not good. But somehow, as human beings, we tend to, tend to instead of being... Our first, our first response to confrontation sometimes is to, to hide. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, when it comes to sin. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, one of the first things that they did is that they run from God. When they did wrong, they ran and hide or hid from God. And that's what oftentimes we may find ourselves doing when we are confronted with the wrongs. Of our actions, wrong actions. Now the statement may have some truth to it. 
but it is often misapplied. The point is, God has the final say as to what our reward will be at the end when he comes. He will reward us based on how we choose to live our lives. However, our actions based on what they are can be considered right or wrong. And our wrong actions can be highlighted to us. That is not judgment. It's, it's called accountability. Amen? So if somebody tells you that you're wrong, that is not judgment. If your action is wrong and you've been told you're wrong, it's not judgment, it's just accountability. It is a system of saying, hey, check yourself, check that. Ensure that it's not repeated because it has consequences. And so the scripture opens us up or exposes up us to the principle of sowing and reaping. He says, if you judge, you will be judged. So if you judge, you will be judged. Here's what it is saying. Don't only look for reasons to condemn somebody. Because if you look for reasons to only condemn, you're going to find it. Listen, nobody has ever lived this life sinless. Jesus alone. And, and, and listen, if we understand grace and we understand the mercy of God, and that is what the scripture is getting up to us, understand grace and understand the mercy of God. So Jesus is confronted with the issue of adultery. And she brings, they bring a woman that is caught in the very act. It's not here, say, they catch she. But when he man there, only she alone come. And they brought her. And here is their motivation for bringing her to Jesus. They wanted to prove him, to tie him up, to trap him up, to see what he would do. See, people sometimes point out other people's wrong, not for the right motives. So they bring the woman to Jesus. And the punishment was she's going to be stoned to death. Jesus stoops down, the scripture says, and he begins to write. Now, some people are using their creative imagination and, be, and says, Jesus write out all the sins of all the accusers. But that's not in the scripture. <laughs> but he sits down and begins to write in the sand and says, He who is without sin, cast the first stone. And the Bible tells you, after a while, he looks up and he says, Woman, where are thou accusers? He says, there's none. Jesus looks to her and says, neither do I condemn you. Go home and sin no more. Don't, don't be caught back in this thing again. Don't, don't make me hear your name call up in this again. He extended grace. He extended mercy. What's the worst thing that you could imagine somebody does? God still gives grace. I'm a recipient of grace. I'm here today because of the grace of God. And day by day, His grace gives me the strength. So, Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If God should mark iniquity, who would stand? The point is not that you trivialize sinful actions. The point that Jesus and God is trying to make is, uh, listen, when people sin and they're in a place of, of, of struggle, you can run to me. 
actions have consequences, of course. So we may not be able to escape the consequences, but we could get forgiveness. So I'm, I'm, I'm going through the articles on, on social media this week, and I'm hearing about this gentleman in our nation who killed some people a couple of years ago. And I'm hearing the sister expressing how she feels about the judgment. And uh, okay, I guess the question was posed to her, well, how do you feel? And, and she admits, listen, it's hard, yes, it's tough. But I've understood that if I don't forgive him, he could ask God for forgiveness and make it to heaven and I go to hell. And she says, I've released him. I've released him because I want to make it to heaven. I want to see God's face. Could you imagine? Sometimes we hold people hostage for some things that... Seriously, that what you're going to go to hell for? Because listen, if you don't forgive... And God meets us. Is hell we going? And that's the reality. If we don't let it go, hell is going to be our portion. So if, if God should mark iniquity, who will stand? Not a man will stand. If God was to hold us accountable for every single thing we thought, we said, we did, we didn't do. If he was to say, listen, all them things there. My goodness, watch a book. Listen, we've got, when, when we understand how much we've been forgiven, then we would be able to forgive people. When you, when you understand the, the, the amount of debt that we owed, Long so. When we understand the depths that Christ went through for us, then we ourselves would be willing to do that for people. I know sometimes we get mixed up in this whole issue of spiritual superiority. And that's an act of the flesh. We, 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 we measure ourselves with each other. So I measure myself with, myself with Colin. And I, and I see where I am. And, you know, I look at my areas of strength and superiority and say, hey, I'm a better Christian than Colin. And, and that's, that's, that's a... That's a that's a terrible mistake. Because the Bible says the race is not for the swift. Nor for the strong. So, so you could be fast like Bolt. And you could be strong like Hulk. It doesn't mean in, with God's race, that is not going to determine whether you win or lose. Because the Bible says, let the weak say I am what? Strong. He takes our weakness and he gives us his strength. So that's how we live our lives every day. In the strength of God. Not by power, not by might, but by the spirit of God. I live through Christ. So I'm able to overcome only because of the strength of Jesus Christ. So that's why it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil. You could dress up in the latest. You know when they have these red carpet. Who are you wearing? And they talk about the brand name. The designers. Me? Me no name. No name brand. <laughs> But, but what makes the difference in your life is what's happening on the inside. It, it, what, what's happening with, am I, am I there with God? Is he, is he sovereign in my life? Uh, do, do I know him? Do I sense him? Do I connect with him? 
That is what is important. So Christianity is not a competition for, between Christians. Listen to me, you're not my competitor. We're not, we, we're, not, we're not trying to compete for the same market space. You understand? I'm, I'm your brother in Christ and you, you are my sister. We are family. So as I'm not competing with you. But, but you're supposed to be and I'm supposed to be. Your yoke fellow. We are in this thing together because we, we want to get there. There is a destination that, that we are focused on. And we must get there together. And that's why the scripture talks about, about all the joint supplying to each other. So I'm, I'm, if, if I'm walking right with God and you are walking right with God and we are doing what we're supposed to do, then you are going to compliment me and you're going to bless me and I'm going to bless you. And, and all the parts are going to flow into each other. So what you get, I get. And what I get, you get. So, so, so if we compete against each other, who gain what? Who get in what? So, so you're, not, you're, not, you're not my enemy. And you're not my competitor. You're my friend. You're my brother in Christ. i got to see you as a gift from God. Are you getting me? You're a gift from God. And, and listen, the enemy seeks to divide us. So, so, so listen, our spiritual fortitude is not measured. I'm not spiritually strong because Colin is spiritually weak. I am spiritually strong because I obey God, not because I look the part. Because I'm living in obedience. He looks like a good Christian. But only God knows. She looks like a good Christian. She sung like she... She know God. But listen, it is measured by our obedience. So that's why, that's why Jesus talks, uh, uh, and Paul talks about it down in Timothy, that, that a form of godliness. We look like Christians, we do Christian things, and we sing Christian songs, and we walk Christian walk. If that be, if that be. But the Bible says, do we deny the power thereof? Yeah. Morning by morning. Listen, there's no, there's, no, there's no spiritual. There's nothing that we, are, that we are contributing that is significant in building of the kingdom of God. So the, so the admonition to judge not is basically about adding value to others. See, we can't make it to heaven if we don't love people. And loving people means you generally desire the best for them. So, so I can look at you. I, I, want, I want you to prosper. I want your family to do well. I want your marriage to work. I pray for you every day. I pray that your children will, will walk in the fear of God. Church, you understand that is what we're called to do. I, I pray for the peace of God to to flood your house. I pray for you to be in strength and health. I see you as God's precious individual. And because I see you as precious to God, I'm going to value you. I, I like to consider myself a realist. I like to deal with real issues. Not skirt around them. Not necessarily. Um, for me, my Christianity is what makes life interesting. It is what makes life so, so extraordinary and, 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 and an adventure. Because how God designed Christianity to function is that we are encouraged by the word of God. We are strengthened and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then we go out there and we live it. 
We manifest it in our homes. We manifest it in our workplace. This is not the... We come here to get encouraged and empowered and we go back out and we release everything that we've gotten. Not here only, but on our knees, in our house, in our homes, on a daily basis. That we, that we, we are charged up. So we have to create an environment and maintain it that says, you are my, I am my brother's keeper. We are standing in each other. Or are we like Cain? So Cain saw his brother doing well with God, being obedient. And he says, you know what? God tell him, listen, what you're doing it is not right. You got to do better than that. And instead of listening to God, he go out and kills his brother. The man never even doing nothing. All he's doing, all he's doing is trying to be obedient to God by bringing the best to God. And Cain say, you know what? If I ain't had nobody here to show me up and make me look bad. Get rid of he. And he kills him. And God comes and begins to question him. And says, oh, am I my brother's keeper? You see, you see when, when offense gets in our heart, we even fly in the face of God. You know, you know we tell God, God, I know your words say, but me not do that. I know your word says, oh, but I'm not doing it. Real Christianity is demonstrated in how well we treat people. How we make them feel. And listen, you won't treat people well if you don't think well of them. Check out our best friends. Oh, listen, our best friends, even if we hear the worst about them, because we love them so much, we will give them a second chance. We will give them the benefit of the doubt, even if we hear the worst thing about them. But why, how can we apply that same principle to somebody else? Give them the benefit of the doubt now. Before we get the facts. So we treat them well. Listen. We wouldn't treat people well if we think bad about them. If you think bad about me, you ain't going to treat me good. And if I think bad, I ain't going to treat you good. That's the reality. Judgment is because of broken relationships. Ungodly judgment is because of broken down relationships why sometimes we treat people the way we treat them. So the big issue is this. God's eternal love for mankind. See, man is the centerpiece of God's creation. God made man in his what? Own image. And his likeness. And God will not allow man to suffer without doing anything. That's why God still haven't come yet. Jesus haven't come yet because he wants everybody to get a chance to repent. He is long suffering. Finally, one of these days, you're going to say, okay, enough. Gabriel, sound the trumpet. Time to gather. But in the meantime, he's extended his grace. Grace. So, so let's look at Jesus' example if we want to get that. Hear this. Jesus knew from among his disciples one would betray him, one would deny him, and the others would run and leave him. So, you get a bunch of people walking with you. I'm only going to stop me in my back. I'm only going to tell life on me. 
And them, them, they didn't care. Jesus knew beforehand. He had the knowledge. If you know where everybody going to you, what are you going to do? Listen, sometimes we even know, we just suspect. We, we, we just suspect. We lock them up. Boom. Oh, we just hear a little thing. Bam. Door close. Jesus is there with these guys day after day. And he know Peter going to deny me. Judas going to betray me. But, but he with them. He loved them. He, he treat them well. He's, he adds value to them. He puts them through the same training program. He, he, he gives the best to them. He gives them opportunities for self-advancement. He gives them all that he could. He pours his life into them. And so the scripture says, when he was reviled, he reviled he not. He, when they did him stuff, my God, what a God. So he says, because I have overcome, you shall overcome too. Jesus was tempted in many points just like as we are, but yet he was without. And then it says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So Jesus saw man's redemption. In the midst of all the chaos and all that man was doing, he saw that man had a future and that he had a hope. And if man could only believe in the God, the great God, and come and ask him for his forgiveness, man would be okay. He saw. He saw us. He saw us, Steve, in all the fish. And he tried to stop us there. You see, just a thing like that. We thief still. We think. You, you understand what I'm saying? We, we think, listen, I mean, if God were to mark iniquity, who would stand? Who would stand? So, so God is saying, have a godly response to somebody who is in awe. Judge not that you be not judged. A judgment is a final pronouncement normally made against someone who has done wrong. A sentencing. See, you know why God tells us not to judge? Because the, problems with, the problem with man's judgment is that sometimes we use people's actions, even though they are wrong, we use it to say they are unredeemable. We look at people and say, them they're not going to come nothing good. They're not capable of anything good. But, but Zacchaeus been a crook and Jesus saved him. So you're going to say, okay, after a while, you're going to put him in the usher's ministry because he was a thief. And Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. And, and if people come and see she on the worship team, they're going to know what they're going to say. But, but me... My sins weren't that public. Nobody here know so much. So I get a pass. You, you, you see how we just do things? That's why Jesus said, judge not, so that you may not be judged. Listen, we, we judge people and we put a block to people who God don't forgive. 
If, if it leave to some people, you ain't see the light today. God don't, God, listen, God don't, you don't ball like your balls. How much time have we do? You regret, you ask God 50 million times to forgive you. And then you put yourself together. God put, put you back together again and you say, okay, now I'm stepping out. And as you step out, somebody, somebody, who should know better? But you check Jesus. He sat, he saw people who had the potential to be restored. So he went by Zacchaeus and said, hey, I'm going home at you tonight. He meets the woman at the well and says, give me a drink of water. He said, what I'm about to give you, you will never thirst again. Your life is going to be transformed. That, that's what God is about. That's what God is about, the changing people's lives. And you know sometimes what gets me sometimes is that sometimes some of we who make some serious mistake, we forget that we made them. And, and we sometimes some of the hardest on people. And we spiritualize it. You know the Lord. Boss, if God didn't show you mercy, you would, you would not dare to talk about know the Lord. If God hadn't shown you mercy, you, you and me, we would have split well, hell wide open already. So, so when God calls people and he saves them, yes, listen, when you catch fish, you just got scale and you have to clean them. You, you understand what I'm saying? I'm just using that expression to get you to understand. When God saves people, they may come in with some scales, but God could clean them up. Trust God for the process to be completed in people's lives. I know I'm talking about you know. So so sober thinking is needed. Sober thinking. We were all guilty enough to be condemned, but God gave us another chance. So, don't turn your noses up, your nose up, at another man's failure. Rather, be moved to a place of intercession and desire their restoration. You see, accountability is never a system of, about embarrassment or condemnation. When somebody has done wrong, it is, the, the process is instituted for restoration. To lead them to a place of spiritual transformation. So, so here's what Galatians 6 and 1 says. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin and you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. So, so the whole thing is about restoration. Helping people to get back on their feet. But, but them no know them no God. We, we use all kind of, we use all kind of stuff. You forget when you say, listen, I'm done with it. Bat up my head, I do whatever happen, happen. If, if not any grace of God, when you plan for go where you go, you will not come back. You will not come back. But the grace of God, even in our ignorance, when we were heading to our own destruction, God says, I still see a future for them. I'm going to put some kind of blockage. Somehow rain come whole day and you ain't leave home. You got wind of some information and you change your mind. Some news tell you, boy, some have no news. No. Me, me, me again, again. But in your own heart and your mind, you already planned it. I'm doing it by the grace of God. And, and, and listen, I'm not here saying that you're soft. Listen, God is the judge. God judges us. That you say, man, sin anyhow, God. Because the scripture says, no, I shall not continue in my sin. 
Because I know grace, God go forgive me. No, that is not the attitude. You don't willfully do stuff. So love is the key as I close this morning. Listen, you see, sin, sin is a terrible thing. Its effect on people is terrible. Listen, I've, I've met people who, who've found themselves in some tough situation that said, listen, I'm going to end it all. I can't face people with this. I can't face the church. I can't face my family. I can't face this, this, this thing. But God is saying, love is the key. Love is always the key. Because the, the, the process of falling is so crushing. See, people need hope and not condemnation. Could you imagine if that woman, yes, yeah, she's wrong and she's wrong. She's ten times wrong. She, she how many times wrong? Shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you're married, you're a covenant, you can't be doing that. That's wrong. And it is not that Jesus was being soft and sin. But Jesus is trying to show you, no matter how far you've gone, the grace of God can bring you back. And he's concerned about people's eternal state. Where are they going to spend eternity? Listen, sometimes we're so vexed with what our Sometimes our children do that we so vex we want that and they run out and, and we forget that their their soul. Because why church people go and talk. But then they still get them in the house. They're gonna turn them out in the street. Gosh. People could they could talk as much as they want to talk. I mean, listen, we have some kind of things that, that we have to deal with. Grapple. Listen, people's souls are most important. People's souls. God cares about people's souls. And he's, the message God gives to us is this. Even if you are at the lowest point of your life and you feel as if you've done, listen, the wrongs that you've done, so terrible that there seems to be no way back. God is saying, listen, my love can help you find your way back. He says, there's still value in you. I still see you as precious. And I'm willing to work with you if you are willing to work with me. Just listen to God this morning. It doesn't matter where you've gone. Today could be the turning around in your life. Today could be the day that you grab a hold of God that you've never grabbed onto him this securely before. And say, God, turn my life around. Turn my life around. Stand with me as we pray today. As we get ready to pray, first I want to pray for those who may not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You don't know him as your Lord, you don't know him as your Savior. And you want to commit your life to him, I want to pray with you. Is there such a person today? Say, I surrender my all to Jesus. Is there anyone here today? Maybe today you feel broken inside. Maybe today you feel so, so battered and bruised and so broken and you're wondering, would it ever get better? And you require prayer today. Would you come? Say, God, I feel so broken inside. I feel so drained. I feel so, 
sometimes I wonder if it ever will change for me would you come this morning would you come 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 quickly let the love of God just flood your life it's holding nothing there may be one person Everything, everything I give to you. Withholding, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. So I want to pray for us today. Father, from day to day we connect with people. And there are events in our lives that sometimes we would not have responded as well as we should. God, we would have acted out of anger and responding out of fear at times but we pray God today that the love of God would be shed abroad in our hearts God we are praying that every action that we would demonstrate would have its foundation in love God, heal broken hearts today. Heal wounds. Maybe we would have said with our mouths to each other, causing God disappointments and brokenness. God, move by your Holy Spirit in this place. Bring transformation to us. Bring change. Bring healing. We pray that we would see each other as valuable and that's precious to you and God that our words would not wound our actions will not bring down but God we would lift up each other and encourage each other in the most holy faith in the mighty name of Jesus God we thank you for giving us so many chances with our lives thank you that you didn't throw us out thank you that you didn't ignore us when we called on you god when we were in that valley of the shadow of death when we are in pieces when we were in brokenness god you came and you lifted us up god you establish us you give us a new song in our hearts hallelujah and God, may we be sensitive to the hurts and the pains around us, to the doubts and the frustration. And so even in this place today, that you would cause healing to flow. Oh God, hearts that are broken would be healed. So we thank you. We thank you for your power and for your anointing to bring change. So as you go out this week, respond in love. Let everything that you do be, have its foundation in love. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. Remember that what lies within you, who lives in you. And let God be glorified in your life this week. In Jesus' name. God bless you as you go. I surrender, 